this is something that we've seen. I'm, I'm always curious how anybody that hunts cuts in kind of different parts of big woods. Uh, I like to ask this question, and, and it comes back to like the lockdown phase of the rut. I mean, how often do you see bucks push does into those younger cuts and pin them down in, in those tops? Pretty often, because you, yeah. like you'll if, if you're hunting the areas like I said where I had the encounter with that other buck the week before, we were seeing tons of deer, and then you know like oh what happened? Like they're not here like that's where they're at the bottom of the drainage was just all these tangled rhododendrons i think they were probably tucked into that stuff because if you go down there there's all that like late rut sign where it's all bedding and just full of deer crap and like you can't get into that stuff like yeah. i actually tried to cross a creek and got tangled in it a few times you know lights camera follow the trail ready to shoot if you know where a deer's bedding and you know where he's eating that deer should be dead camera if you're passive on a deer, what you're doing is you're teaching. I've got 30 bucks in the Michigan record book. Everyone but one has had at least one previous wound on his body. Some had as many as four. <laughs> Trail Cam Radio from the guys at Exodus. We are live at day two, episode three of the Great American Outdoor Show podcast series, Trail Cam Radio. We have Aaron Hepler. And Aaron, you just published your first article with us. I did. This I'm past su week. super pumped to get involved yeah you're a black hat member elite company yeah tell people a bit who you are and what you do for a living i'm from the great state of pa don't live too far from here i've uh been a nurse for about 12 years and i just uh i got involved with exodus through uh through clint campbell just writing for an outlet but it's been tons of fun it's been a cool cool road and so what do you do for a living i'm a i'm a nurse in the intensive care mm -hmm. yeah makes for good hunting because you were saying you work three twelves and then you have yeah four days off a week yep make my own schedule how That's, how much in advance can you make your schedule so we make our schedule six weeks in advance so. oh wow mm -hmm. that's a lot of flexibility yeah i mean for out of for like short out of state trips or if, if you wanted to do something like that i mean you could you could bang some stuff out the bad part is Fronts. not knowing the weather yeah six yeah. weeks out i mean yeah. four days get though. yourself in a pickle yeah, yeah i mean I'd yeah well the other thing that i do for like during the hunting season is i'll just um when i make that schedule i can put in like single eto days like vacation days or whatever so I just pick a couple rent. Like I'll pick an extra day. Like in the beginning of October, I'll take one day a week, and then as it get like gets closer to the rut, I'll take two, maybe three. This year, between October and November, I worked like fifteen days. So you only worked fifteen days in two months. Mm -hmm. That's that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> so people, if they want to hunt more, should just become a intensive yeah. care nurse. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm recruiting right now. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, we need you. <laughs> yeah. That's really cool. That's a that's a huge benefit. Yeah, it is to to be able to do that. So yeah, it's a cool job too. It's a little it's it's rewarding some days. You know, some days it sucks, but yeah, I couldn't imagine. So how long have you been hunting? Tell us a little bit about how you got into it, developed a passion. My whole so my whole family's been hunters my entire life. I uh, in PA you can start hunting when you're twelve, or actually when when I started you could start hunting when you're twelve. So that's what I did. My dad always was take me you know squirrel hunting or turkey hunting. I had a lot of friends that hunted and. Uh, Grew up hunting on a farm with some family friends, and just my passion grew from there. One of my buddies um, that lives on the farm still, you know, he still he actually runs the farm with his dad, and uh, he's huge into it. So we just grew up bow hunting together. We used to try to make little films together when we were like, you know, fourteen years old. We would drive the tractor because he couldn't drive a truck yet, so we would drive the tractor over to the <laughs> the sections of the farm, you know, and yeah, just loved it from there. As far as public, the public land thing, I've been doing that for about seven years. Not exclusively, like I'll still hunt the farm. Mostly the areas that I'm hunting, are, I'm hunting for does. And then during the rifle season, I'll, I'll hunt almost strictly the farm because I get all my doe tags for there and I don't want to get shot. So, What, what <laughs> provoked you to want to try public land seven years ago? I don't remember when it was. I think I was in nursing school and I read like a Dan Infall article. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. Like, because I've never, I never had really had the opportunity to, to to encounter or see a really big buck on the farm. Like, we we knew they were there, and occasionally I would see one, but never had like a real like, oh, there's a slammer. Sure. Um, I read his article, and you know, you would occasionally hear people shoot a big buck around here on public land, but the way people talked about public land around here, it would be like, oh, you know, it's negative see, connotation. Yeah, every, if it's brown, it's down. Nobody ever sees any deer. I remembered walking through different areas when I was pheasant hunting and being like, I don't know, like there's a lot of like big rubs here. Or like it just like everything made sense and you'd like read stuff that Dan would put out. I mean, you read articles and everybody's, you know, most of those North American whitetail or whatever it is, yep. it's just like outfitted things or, you know, farm-based food plot, that kind of thing. But I'd get on these public pieces and I'd see all these 
this sign and be like, well, whatever he's writing about makes sense. And whatever they're saying might be a little old school, especially because when I was like 13, we put the, we put the antler report, the APRs. Yeah. The APRs in place here. Junior hunters can still shoot like a spike buck or whatever, which I think is great. You know, if it keeps a kid involved because they shoot yeah. a spike, have at it. Like, yeah. I don't care. But, um, I think that really helped. And I, that was one thing that really drove me to really want to try public land. But I couldn't find anybody that wanted to do it. So I would like, you know, mosey on to some stuff myself. But I eventually found a buddy that I worked with who's like, hey, I read this thing. We got to try this. So um, we ended up hunting, uh, you know, scouting and hunting public land a lot together. And I actually told you the story. Well, we probably did it for about two or three years before we, you know, really started to learn what would work for our area. I'm sure we'll get into this, but I found some clear cuts on a, uh, I was like, we got to we gotta take a hike out to this spot and take a look at it. So we went out shed hunting and hiked out to this clear cut. And this was, I think, my third year hunting public land. We got there and it was just like, oh, this is awesome. And it was like, oh, what's over the next part? What's over the next part? And we just picked this whole clear cut apart and had a really good day in October, nice weather front. It was uh, like October 22nd. And he was like, we, we got to go. That's the day we got to go. It was a 15 degree temp drop overnight. Still, it was still warm. Like, you know, I think the day before it was like 70 degrees and it was dropping to a high of 55 and low 30s in the morning. I had found a, a water hole that was down one of the two tracks that went through the logging road. It was, a you know, overgrown and stuff already. I got off onto this logging, logging track and, and sat over this water hole and, um, I arrowed my first buck over that water hole that day. So I'd been hunting with a bow for about 18 or 20 years, and um, that was my first buck with a bow. It was a 10, uh, public land 10 point. I'd missed plenty. I had plenty of opportunities as small deer, but that was um, that really was like a turning point for the public land thing for me. So, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. What bear was that? A bear almost climbed my tree that morning too. <laughs> <laughs> what, what were the emotions after having that finally come together after that long and on oh, the ground? It was, and it was amazing. I, thing? I remember... You know, you have that initial, like, I mean, I'm sure you guys had it early on when you'd, like, pull your bow back and then just, I can't remember anything that happened until I saw the deer running away. Sure. And I remember I remember pulling my bow back and <laughs> settling the pin, and I was like, get it together. Like, I remember literally saying, get it together. And, like, I like came back to focus, and I remember seeing my pin, and <laughs> my peep sight was way off. And I was like, good thing you chilled out. And I like put my peep back on the on the pin, and I remember watching my arrow go, and I remember the hole opening in his side, and I remember the deer like just kind of looking around and and taking off, and I was like, I just double lunged him, like I I knew it was a good shot, you know, it was twelve yards. I couldn't see further than I think my my furthest shot in that in that spot was fifteen yards. It was so thick, and I'd watched the deer for forty five minutes. Whoa, that's a super long count. Yeah, he ended up like. I ended up actually, like, I could hear deer chasing in this cut the whole day, and he was, you know, they were grunting and whatever, and he, I ended up just hitting the grunt tube, and he came, like, charging down this little slope, and I could see the tree swaying because he was rubbing, rubbing as he came in, and he stopped behind. I could see his antlers, and he's twisting his antlers to get through the little saplings, and I'm, like, I remember thinking, holy crap, like, that's the biggest buck I've ever had in front of me while I'm hunting, and he stops behind this laurel bush, and he's just, he knew something wasn't right. Like, I don't know. Maybe he got his butt kicked. I don't know. Because he wasn't, like, overly, like, he didn't look spooky. He just looked like he was being cautious. And I remember him stopping behind this laurel bush, and he was just, like, chewing his cud and looking around. And then he'd, like, scratch his back with his antlers. And then, you know, and the whole time, like, every time he moved, my heart would race a little bit faster. And then it would, like, slow back down. And then it race a little bit faster. And I remember finally he just kind of started – like he took a step and I'd get ready to draw my bow and nope, not yet. And then he'd take another step and I'd get ready to draw. And finally he just, he was getting ready to take a couple steps. I drew and he came behind a tree at the, at 12 yards. And, and that was when I, you know, had the, had the moment of get it together. You're like, you need to make yeah, yeah. like, cause like I said, every other time I've shot at a buck, I've had like a blackout moment and like either shot over him or shot under him or whatever it was. Um, but I remember, I'm just like, hell yeah, like I got it. Like, <laughs> and then I was like, well, oh, just now calm down. Like he might be, you know, laying down yeah. right over there. You need to calm down. So then uh, I called my wife and I was like, I just shot a 10 pointer, you know, like, and she's like, no way, you know. And I, I called my buddy on the farm then and I, I was like, dude, I just killed a 10 pointer. And he's like, just chill out, man. Like, you know how to, like, you, all right, just relax. 
you know, and he's, he's, uh, like I said, he's been, I've known the kids since we were in fifth grade and, you know, I've hunted together and he, he, he does a really good job at, um, uh, hunting on his farm and, you know, has had some really good success there. So he know he, uh, he's like one of the people that, you know, you're like, you got to call him up and be like, Hey, what do I got to do here? Cause I can't think straight, you <laughs> know, expert. here's the, here's the situation and you need to tell me what to do. Cause yeah. I'm going to do something stupid, you know? And he's like, just wait for like an hour and a half because it's cold enough. It was still in the thirties. And he's like, just wait for a while. And I called my buddy that I was hunting with and I was like, all right, I, I, there's a 10 pointer. He's like, well, I'm going to sit till 10. Cause we actually ended up almost doubling that day on it. He almost shot a uh, eight pointer that was the same size that ended up winding him. Like the thermals picked up and ended up swirling where he was sitting on the end of this ridge. And, uh, this, he was, he was just about to draw his bow and, and make a shot on that deer. So it was, it was a, it was a cool moment for both of us. Cause we're like, finally something clicked, you know, we did this mm-hmm. public land thing and, and, uh, and we're able to, you know, really find a spot that worked, worked well for us. So from the day you read that, uh, Dan and Fall article to the day you aired that deer, how, how, what was the distance again? Like year wise? That was probably about four years. So That's I read usually it, what he says, how yeah, long it takes to. Yeah. I started the, we started really scouting public land and hunting it for about three years from the time I, I killed that deer. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was kind of like a surreal morning, you know, like as soon as the gray light hit, I remember being in that tree and something was running circles around my tree stand and I couldn't tell if it was like a coyote or what it was or a little doe. But then I remember, you know, hearing stuff coming through the bushes and getting ready to draw my bow because I'm like, oh, there's a big buck. And this bear came came out of the bushes and was drinking. Like my tree, the base of the tree I was sitting at, the roots were touching the water hole. And this water hole is like, I don't know, f- a five by five water hole. And the bear came to the water hole and he was drinking out of it. He went around the he went around the backside of this water hole and stopped at the base of my tree and put his paw on it and looked up and I was like, don't you do it. (laughs) And he was like, like he did, you know, you could tell he was like, Oh shoot. Yeah. He didn't smell me at all. I don't know how my wind was like landing on him. And, uh, he stopped at the base of that tree and his head snapped up and he barked at me and ran away. And I was like, whoo, that's a heck of a day. And I can't like, I can never, everybody's like, did that really happen? I'm like, yeah, it happened. But I couldn't take, I was had, I was like, I'm not going to film a bear that's my, about to climb my yeah, tree. Yeah. Cause it happened. Like when he was drinking out of the water hole, I wasn't even thinking about it. I was like, Oh cool. A bear, you know, like, and I, I'm like, Oh, I should get my phone out. But by then he was like already circling the tree and had put his hand on his, and I'm like, Nope, <laughs> not doing that. What year was that? Uh, 2018. 2018. Yep. And so <clears throat> I guess, Anything else on on that progression? I mean, after since two thousand eighteen, what have you learned from that a first initial success in that type of setting to four years later? Yeah, um, really. I mean, the the biggest thing is the postseason scouting element of it, and that was that was what helped me kill that deer. Like, I I'd, I'd really grown up never really you don't we didn't really need to scout the farm. Like, we'd get there in the fall and see where their rubs were being made, and be like, okay, this is. You know, it's probably because this year this is corn and they like the inside edge of it and all the rubs are opening up, you know, rubs and scrapes are opening up here. But I never really, like, took the posting season scouting thing to heart really because of that. Like, we didn't really have to. Sure. And, um, you know, with with public land, you can really kind of pick apart what happened in maybe the beginning, like, the pre-rut time frame versus the rut time frame. Um, so going in postseason and picking out – um, elements of your scouting that are going to help you through the entire season then. So you're picking something out that's going to work for the early part of October, the middle, and then finding those rut, the, the travel corridors, really. And um, so the year after I killed that buck, um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think of what kind of year. I think I had some, some encounters with some good ones. That year um, I did. I had some encounters with some great deer. Um, I ended up, I kind of always based something off clear cuts and the clear cuts I found in the area the following year were really too pressured. Like there's a lot of like tree stands and. Was it because it was too fresh of a cut? No, they were, they're like, 
it's it's a series of I'm not going to say how many cuts because somebody will know exactly where it's at, but it's a lot of them, right? And uh, like a smaller, they're smaller, smaller like right? Checkerboard. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, some of them are big. Like some of them might be 50 acres. Some oh, okay. of them might be 10 acres. Okay. So, but there's a whole. It's it's a it's a lot of them, right? And it, they they both both sides of a service road, right? They're right on the service road. Okay. So easy to get to, pressured, lots of sign, like big. You know, bucks are definitely using it and bedding in it probably at night um, and feeding there. But I found the the area that was kind of adjacent to that where it's like kind of, I wouldn't say mature because there is some young forest in it and a lot of undergrowth, like good undergrowth, browse. And um, I ended up scouting that part of it because I was like, this part's too pressured. I found too much people sign. So I found this other part and it was really... I really wanted to scout it because I had a whole bunch of buddies that, you know, I go with at the hospital and I'm like, oh, you know, this would be a good area where, you know, if we all came for a rut sit, like if five of us wanted to hunt together or something, we could really spread out in this ridge on a rut day and just kind of watch everything roll through. And um, I found a really nice shed there and, uh, you know, a couple small ones or whatever. And I, so I'm like, okay, so this is the side bucks really, bucks really like this side. And, um, that part of the property was actually adjacent to a lot of private, like a couple thousand acres of private. So it's kind of sandwiched between two good, you know, two good elements. I knew it was a rut travel corridor because you could just, I mean, you could follow the trail like the entire length of the ridge almost. So was lots that of, like on the upper one third or what elevation? It was, was the that? upper one third. Okay. And actually though, the sign that I found was on the upper one third, but when I hunted it, I found that the bucks were chasing does almost at, at the halfway mark because that's kind of the, it was more of a gentle, like a gentle slope and then ducked over hard around the halfway point. So the bucks were kind of running more towards the halfway point. Um, so again, the buddy that I, I killed that 10 pointer with, we went up and we're checking this spot out and, um, he ended up sitting, I ended up, he only knew one spot there because I was the only one who had scouted it and I had checked a camera with him and I was like, you go where that camera is. He's like, well, that's probably the best spot. Don't you want to sit there? I'm like, no, because you don't know how, like, I'm going to send you in here. You're going to go to the wrong spot. So just sit there because you know where it's at. He ended up seeing 10 bucks that day on that ridge point and wow. I think four of them were probably about 120 inches. Um, and just couldn't make couldn't make a shot happen. He was sitting close to the to the property line, and they kept going, you know, twenty or thirty yards over the property line. Um, but it was it was like one of those. I mean, I think it was uh, it was rut. It was like November fourth. I think was the was the date for that. And it was just one of those days where you just it. He was just, every every time he texted me, buck buck buck, you know. I'm like, Man. and I'm thinking man, I must've picked the bad spot, you know? And, uh, finally, and finally by like seven thirty, I started, started like hearing grunting and chasing and I had a small buck chase a doe by, and then a deer that was probably 115, 120 inch came running by and I grunted him and he, I was too far up because I was in that upper one third and I looked at the deer and I'm like, come on, dude. And he's just kind of like checking out, like, where's the buck? Where's the buck? And the doe that he was with took off and he just zipped after her. And I'm like, well, you know, when I come back in here, I know like I'm just going to drop down. I was actually hunting a ditch system and all this, like all the seepage, you know, so I was just kind of like, oh, just follow the water. So um, that's kind of why I used that area because they were crossing this particular part of this ditch. So I ended up dropping down. We went back on like, I think the 14th of November and I ended up dropping down uh, dropping down the ridge and, um, and same thing. I had a button buck, like chasing a doe around my stand by seven thirty in the morning. And then that was it. And he's not really seeing anything. So I'm like, Oh, maybe, you know, we're already into the, like, they're locking stuff down. I don't know. But whatever that button buck was chasing was hot enough that, that I think, I think at nine thirty or something, I hear a little twig break and I had the darndest time climbing the tree that I climbed because it was full of all those like little sucker saplings. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
I was like, well, I don't know exactly. There was two trails there, and I'm like, I don't know exactly which one. So I wanted a tree with a lot of cover, so I picked that one. But it took me forever to climb it because I'm telling you, like every every time I hung a stick, I was putting it around like, you know, five or six sections of these sucker saplings. And um, when I got high enough, I was only I was only probably like 16 feet high, and um, I couldn't get any higher because then there were big branches above that. So I'm like, well, I'm just going to face downhill because, you know, that's kind of the best way that these trails won't see me. And um, I actually expected the deer to come from the opposite direction of the ridge, but today they were coming from the direction they weren't, you know, the, the opposite direction from where they were coming the week before. And I hear a, a twig break and I kind of look behind me and all I can see is this big rack. And I'm like, oh, shoot. And he's already at, 15 yards i'm like oh man and this was this was probably 140 inch uh 140 inch nine point oh wow Good yeah and um i'm thinking how am i gonna get turned around without like because i was not it wasn't like i was completely op like th i was the wrong direction like my sil if i moved he was gonna see my silhouette and he started going up the ditch and i remember thinking all right he's turned around like get up i got up and my tree stand squeaked and i'm like oh and he turned around and snapped his head, and he's looking. And my wind was blowing to him, but my thermals were pulling down this ditch, which was why I really wanted to stay on the ditch because the water was so cold, and it was pulling sure. everything down with it. So every time I threw milkweed out, if I would throw it out here, it would kind of like drift up the hill a little bit but suck right back down into the ditch. So he kept looking at me, and like, you know, he'd put his nose in the air, but he couldn't smell anything, so he would – go back on his way and um i finally got turned around and got my boat up to half and my tree stand squeaked again and he looked over and he's like you know kept doing the head snapping thing and he ended up blowing and stood there at 70 yards just <laughs> i'm thinking you moralizing oh. but um it was cool because it kind of just compounded on the things that we learned the year before and um that was actually my a second encounter with a big buck that year. Um, I actually forgot about the other one, but that I did have an encounter with another another big deer that year, and same kind of same kind of deal. I based it off of um, a clear cut, but actually a really old clear cut, um, like a twenty year old clear cut. They were using the edge to bed around it, and uh, yeah, that was like a. We don't have to go into that story if you don't want to. But. Well, I think uh, there's an overarching theme here. It's clear cuts, so let's just dive yeah. into clear yeah. cuts. Yeah. Um, so I pulled this from – I yanked it right from Clint's blog <laughs> that you wrote. <laughs> nice. Because I know there's uh, there's multiple items that you wanted – that you discussed. I think it's kind of a, a great conversation to just burn through some of these. Yeah. So I'm reading some of these. I'm not – I'm from – there's not much timber where, where I'm at. So some of these terms are completely foreign to me. So what the heck is a ring trail? So actually, I learned I learned the the, the ring trail term from um, uh, Brad Herndon's book. You ever read, read no. that book? Um, Mapping that Trophy Whitetails, tail. right? That's I have, a, okay. No, I have it. I burned through it. <laughs> it's a. I need it, to take better notes reading for comprehension. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, I mean, really, it's a it's a really great book, um, especially if like people are starting out doing beginning on public land. It's really a, a good thing to learn the terms and kind of just like basic terrain features. Um, I'm sure it's made a lot of terrain features like sat. He's a big saddle guy. You know, I don't like hunting saddles because everybody else likes hunting saddles. Yep. But, um, you know, that was one really big thing. I mean, his book is a little older too at this point, you know, but um, a ring trail is just, I, I just consider it the trail that goes on the outside edge of a clear cut. Um, and you can almost follow it around an entire cut, no matter how big it is. So the cut that I ki killed that 10 point is that, is that trail actually from equipment? Or just naturally from deer from or deer. both? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Occasionally you'll have a, a, a ring trail that's like an old two track, but you can tell that deer are using it because mm -hmm. um, it's the easiest way for them to walk around in. And there's a lot of good browse around those a lot of times. But the the cut that I killed my 10 point, the that first 10 pointer in is about, I, I want to say it's 310 acres. It's, re it's a really big cut and it's been done consecutive years so when i the section that i was hunting at the time was i think five years old but there was a part that was a year old and there was a part that was three years old so that part was cut 
consecutively a lot. So there was a lot of different food in that area. Um, but you can, there's only one section that you won't walk on a deer trail around the outside edge of it. So that's, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a ring trail. That's a really good area. Um, uh, a really good area that I found like you're gonna, you're gonna have a lot of good encounters on that. What if you find a scrape there? Cause you make a note of that. What's, what's the scrape? Yeah. The so, so, uh, a lot of the times the, the scrapes are bait. So I think bucks use the ring trails just to send check when, um, when does are bedding in those areas. Um, but every time I found a scrape on a ring trail, uh, you'll have an entrance at like an entrance trail into the, into the cut. So I think that's where they're kind of meeting the does or where the does are, you know, willing to come out of the bed, leave their scent. And the bucks are just checking those scrapes as they're going around the outside edge. So yeah, you'll, you can find a lot. I, especially like that spot. I actually had a, uh, a double scrape under like some rhododendron or something that, that, that particular entrance trail led straight into entrance deer trail led straight to the water hole that I was hunting. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, uh, let's talk a little about, uh, log landing openings as well. So how big are those typically? I'm sure that's different on the terrain and the cut. Right. So it, it varies on, you know, whatever equipment they're using. I think, um, the, there was a, uh, a log landing on this particular spot too. And they usually end up like throwing clover down, something yep. to seed, like something so that the Erosion. it doesn't erode, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> and um, you know, typically less than even half an acre. Mm -hmm. um, but depending on what they put in there, you can see that those areas are are dug up pretty good. I found sheds in them a few times. Um, it's a good starting point for scouting. Um, because out of that whole clear cut, that's a really nice congregating area for deer. Um, those love them. I say, do they bed just right on the edge of those? Yeah. Typically? Mm -hmm. So I, I like to, I like to start scouting around them. I don't, I can't say I've ever hunted one mostly because like they, they're like food plots. So, you know, usually somebody will end up hanging a tree stand yeah. in November on those or something like that. Um, but you know, the, the pressure in the areas that I hunt is almost, nothing during the week um in in until the probably the end of october early november so they aren't they aren't bad places to check out yeah especially for sheds to maybe check out and like you said it's a starting point yeah I mean, then you can work backwards so um you have here a skitter maze so what are <laughs> what i like that that's funny what yeah. uh tell us a little bit about that so um this is a uh I think that's my own term to be completely honest. <laughs> trademark yeah, it right yeah, now. I'm gonna no. trademark it. Skitter maze. So, if you ever look at a, a new cut on on hunt mapping, you'll see like usually they stem out from that that food plot, and it'll go. You'll have a, a like a two track logging road that'll go in straight, and then off of that, you'll have like all these fingers mm -hmm. where they, you know, had were logging in this section and took a truck down and you know, anywhere from five to 20 of these things will be branching. It'll look like a tree almost on the, on, on Onyx, just branched out. And you can follow, those are the easy ways through the cut. So it's good access into the cut. Uh, you know, I mean, if you're in, walking in through a five-year-old cut, it's half the time you can't walk through it. Right. So that's the way to get into the middle of it. If you want to do it, you got to really, if, if you're doing it in the dark, you really got to take your time. Um, but as they get overgrown, it's, you know, it makes it a little bit easier because you, you get some screening cover unless they're bedding right on the edge of it, which they usually don't. They're always, you know, in a little off of that, but they travel on them, so you have to watch that too. But um, it's the perfect way to get inside a cut, and a lot of times the entrance to those skitter mazes is blocked off, so a lot of people don't see them mm. because it's already, you know, it's grown shut with what's ever there, you know. So those are those are ways that I like to access into a middle of a cut if they're, you know, not unpenetrable themselves. What kind of uh, herbaceous growth or regeneration are you getting in these cuts? Is it, lo uh, is it like a lot of uh, hardwood, like oak maple regrowth, or is it more uh, green briar, blackberry, you know, mountain laurel type stuff? So it depends on, this, on the stage of the cut, but um, the ones that I really prefer, do they do have a lot of oak, 
regeneration. If you can find those stumps that have all those sucker, oh, those yeah, oaks, those, grass, those yeah. years, they'll yeah. eat those for years. Um, and the green briar they love. So I really like one that's mixed, but the ones that tend to be maple that I've hunted don't tend to work out as well. Um, mid October, they're okay. Cause as those leaves start to turn Sugar red a little maples, bit, yeah. they love them. Yep. Um, so you'll find deer are like magnets that area for that short like week or two as the leaves are starting to get yellow you know a little yellow and red but most of the most of the best growth is um is uh is oak and green briar yeah. and it i prefer if it's mixed right um and most of the time they are like they'll grow you know it as the oaks get too big then you start to have the green green briar die off but yeah. when they're in that like you know anywhere between three and seven year old around here that they they tend to be mixed yeah um, and obviously there's just, there's mountain laurel everywhere. So you'll have a little bit of that, but that's just for the scenery, you know? So have you had more <laughs> luck on ring trails or skitter mazes? Uh, skitter mazes. So yeah. more, okay. So I'm just trying to, pri yeah. I'm trying to mentally prioritize of where is the best place. To if you, if you want to see a lot of deer, like if you're burnt out, a ring trail is a really good place to sit. Cause you're going to just have things filter by you all day mm -hmm. and you know, you'll you'll see a lot of does and small bucks and um i yeah, i think the time where a ring trail really starts to get good for a bigger buck doesn't really happen until the end of october sure um not that i mean obviously there's outliers but i think that that would be the best time to, to have prioritize yeah. the time there mm -hmm. okay. at what stage in those cuts do you see deer activity start to die off like I, age wise Age wise, yeah. Like, how old of a cut do you say? Okay, it's starting to lose its value because this is something that we have a number where, like, some of the cuts that we hunt, but we've been up in the Allegheny National Forest, and I'm talking probably an eight hour drive, mm -hmm. like north to south. I don't know what, how many miles that is. Yeah, and I think part of it comes back to soil too, but the levels of g regeneration seem to be so much slower with that, you know, um, distance from north to south. So right. I'm curious, like, what what you see in that. Well, you, and you and I were talking about things being behind yesterday. Yeah. And then I, th I thought about that last night, actually, like, um, you know, I've hunted... Like uh, growth being behind? Yeah. Okay. So I've hunted, I've hunted southern Ohio. So where I'm hunting from, as far as north to south goes, it's 150 miles, like, vertical. Okay, so right? relatively close. So, right. So here compared to like that Northwest region of PA, it, it's even faster, right? Mm -hmm. Cause we don't have, you know, up there, you like you, your ice thaw and your things like that are, are even a lot slower than they are here. We don't get nearly as much snow as the Northern half of PA. Right. Um, so not, not too far away. Um, but as far as like quality of, of brows, I, I'm going to scout every clear cut. I've, I've hunted, like I said, I hunted clear cuts that were 20 years old and they weren't using it for food, but they were using it because people weren't going in there. Yep. Um, but, uh, as far as if I'm going to pick one that I think that they're in all the time using for bedding, browse and food, um, I'm, I'm not like somewhere between three and seven is my, yep. my favorite okay. time. Okay. Um, but again, like I've used those old clear cuts that are just like eight foot silver poles, you know, I've used those and they really like them sometimes, you know, when they're getting pressure, actually that the day that my buddy saw 10 bucks, when I came back out to get him, um, there was a doe and a buck bedded on the edge of the logging road I was walking out and, uh, they jumped up and they ran into one of those old cuts and I drew my bow because he was like, I don't know, he was like a hundred and inch eight, eight. I was, I was going to shoot him. Yeah. And, uh, he got into these poles and I couldn't make a shot and he's just, stand, he's, he's like 35 yards and just like every time he moved, I could like, he would just kind of like shift a little bit and I couldn't get a shot at him because it's like a maze for your, you can't like, yeah. you can't really see through no, it. No straight. Yeah. Straight you line. can see the deer like he's clear as day, but you have no, like, how am I going to get my arrow through there? And I think, I mean, they're smart enough to know that. Like he just sure. stood there and he kind of just walked away and I'm like, all right, well, that sucks. <laughs> but, um, yeah, they'll, they'll still use them. What about, um, this is something that we've seen. I'm, I'm always curious. I, anybody that hunts cuts in kind of different parts of big woods, uh, I like to ask this question and, and it comes back to like the lockdown phase of the rut. I mean, how often do you see 
Bucks push does into those younger cuts, like and pin them down in, in those tops. Pretty often, because yeah. like you'll if, if you're hunting the areas, like I said, where I had the encounter with that other buck the week before, we were seeing tons of deer, and then you know, like, oh, what happened? Like they're not here. Like that's where they're at. Yeah. Um, this particular area, they would push them in the the bottom of the drainage was just all these tangled rhododendrons. I think they were probably tucked into that stuff because if you go down there, there's all that like late rut sign where it's all bedding and just full of deer crap and like you can't get in you can't get into that stuff like yeah. i actually tried to cross a creek and got tangled in it a few times you know but um it doesn't take much like that's like a 50 yard wide section and they're just i think they're just piled in there based on what you find when you walk when you try get into the edges of it and stuff like yeah, that sure let's talk a little bit out a little about funnels between the cuts where they cut some they left some they cut some yeah. What's the effectiveness of, of that type of uh, feature? So this is this is a good time to talk about that because the the first encounter I had that that year after I killed the ten pointer, um, I had picked a cut that was twenty years old and one that was like fifteen, and I had shed hunted it, and it was still pretty defined, like the the route that was between those two cuts, like you could tell the difference. Like, you know, you have all those little poles or whatever, but the food was pretty good in this, in this in between, because it was only, it was like a hundred yards wide, maybe 150. So all that sunlight came into the edge of that strip that they left between the cut. Right. So that's where they were getting their food from in that area. Plus maybe a little food plot, like half a mile away or whatever. And, um, I picked that area cause I was like, well, they're running through here. It's a nice, like, early to mid season. Cause there's a lot of white Oaks in there and the, the browse was pretty good. So I'd pick this area again, my buddy sitting at the end of the Ridge and nothing was happening. Like it was a really windy day and, um, he had seen, you know, a little bit of stuff and I hadn't seen anything and I got bored and I snort wheezed. <laughs> and 10 minutes later, it's like 11 o'clock in the morning. And we're about to leave because we're not, you know, nothing's happening. And um, 10 minutes later, this buck comes, like, running up this trail that he had, like, I had seen scrapes on, like, new scrapes. Came running up this trail. And I picked my bow up because I'm like, oh, he's 120-inch eight point. Like, let's go. Pick my bow up. And I come to full draw, and he stops behind these saplings. And as soon as he stops, he hit my wind, like, dead on and just like gone and I'm thinking what you know but that was why I was hunting that was because I was hunting one of those funnels between the cuts mm -hmm. and he actually was using the edge like the brushy edge of that new regrowth to run up the edge of this 20 year old cut I, I think they were bedding in there to you know to stay away and be you know kind of be out of the wind those poles break the wind still sure um and I, I did walk back through that cut, and you're seeing a lot of sign. Like, a lot, they're rubbing everything in there, and the trails are good through there. Is Obviously, that a picture? No, that's one of the – that's one of the new – that's a – New location? Cut, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So this is kind of interesting, something I've never even considered. So you mentioned islands in timber cuts. So those are areas where they, they just – don't cut and what's the reason why they wouldn't cut it so they leave those trees for seed trees so you have a couple different select cuts where they'll clear cut everything and only leave red oaks right so then that kind of ends up being like dotted um but there's there's some cuts well they well the where they leave like a, a quarter acre section of and mostly most of the time they leave it because it's just a big cluster of oaks but they'll leave those trees to seed and I don't know what their what their idea is, like if that happens to 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 blow seeds out better or whatever, you know, if it's but some of the cuts that we hunt will have like four of these islands and they'll be How know, big would an island be, for example? So like probably about a half an acre, maybe okay. a little bit less. Um some of them are if you sat in the middle of them, you could shoot the whole thing. Okay. Um but that's what they look like in this cut, because you'll have like everything flattened and then you'll have this one cluster of trees. Um, and usually they're hard to get to cause they're usually there's not like a two track that goes to them. Um, so you're, you're, you're busting brush to get into them. So they're, you know, you kind of got to navigate your way. If you're planning to hunt one of those, you got to navigate your way to them before the season cause you're not getting into it otherwise. Mm -hmm. But again, lots of good sign deer like to bed close to them. I think it tends to be like, um, 
uh, like nighttime bedding because they you can see that they're feeding on the the acorns that fall in those areas. But that's okay. uh, have you had any success on an oak island? <laughs> I actually haven't hunted any of them yet. No. Um, I've found a lot of sheds in them, mm-hmm. um, which is we usually end up scouting them and, and finding sheds. Um, I know I have a few buddies that have hunted them and have had good encounters or, you know, had a lot of deer sightings in there. That's a really good place. Again, another good congregating area. And it's nice because it's a secluded congregating area, so they're pretty com- comfortable in there. Mm-hmm. Um, but, no, I actually haven't hunted one personally myself. Just uh, Just scouted and shed hunted mm-hmm. them and – you know, as far as that goes, here's, here's an interesting point. You, so you talk about water sources and springs, but, um, tell us a little bit about something if there isn't any of those and it's related to logging trails. Right. So one of the, one of the good things in a, in a fresh logging cut is you have a lot of heavy power equipment that's going through there and they leave a lot of tire treads, right? Those, especially if, if the soil is good and you have some clay mixed in there, those tire treads retain a lot of water. And it almost makes like a little uh, kind of a marshy Mini environment, <laughs> at least for a couple of years until the stuff dies and starts to fill that stuff in. But deer really like to bed close to them because in the summertime, they're, it's cool. Um, I've seen where, you know, they're crossing them all the time and then where they're drinking out of them. Um, they don't care if they're drinking out of a mud hole. Like if it's there it's and it's like, a, I mean, sometimes those things are like a desert in the summertime. If it's cool and they have something to drink, they're going to be next to it. Um, and a lot of times that's where all the good stuff to eat is, right? Like summertime food for me, especially for like getting velvet pictures and stuff like that. I found an area with like blueberries and pokeberries and the deer love them. If bears aren't in there, deer are munching them up. But those areas really retain a lot of water um, because of those, most of the, because of the heavy equipment that's been running through them. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I would have never really thought of that. So I think we'll, one of my last questions here. So tell us about these old cuts. So it seems like every your favorites are the three to seven year old range. Yep. So tell us a little bit about the ones that are quote unquote past their prime. Yeah. So again, these are the ones that are like the, the silver pole timber that you see. And I really, if I'm going to hunt them, I'm hunting that section that runs in between them, the funnel that's between them. And I don't, I think they're not all created equally. Like there's going to be ones that are obvious to, to easily to get into and uh, things like that. So I just think that if you're going to hunt an old cut, you have to have a reason. So find the bedding that's around the cut. Um, you know, the ones that I've hunted to usually have something, maybe they, they bush hog one edge of it to keep a service road open. And the deer really like the regrowth that happens in that brush cut, uh, you know, that bush hogging area. So they'll, they'll nip it from the service road or, or they feel comfortable walking up the edge of that service road to access the other side of the cut. And usually that leads to the other side of the ridge. So it's always a destination point. When you're hunting one of those things, you're not necessarily hunting that old cut, but what is around that cut or where that where that uh, funnel would lead to. What about uh, – talk a little bit about your camera strategy. Like that's something that we really haven't talked about. I mean, obviously you're focusing on the stuff that what most big wood hunters, you know, focus on. I mean, once somebody kind of gets the hang of what they're doing, a lot of attention gets drawn to – cuts and, and terrain features i mean topography yeah talk a little bit about what you're what you're doing with cameras on that stuff so my my camera strategy usually starts in like june like every like i'll get my stuff out in june and again i'm 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 starting inside the cut so but i don't like to move my cameras too much because they still use that cut in the fall for something so at, when i hang the cameras i hang them in spots that i'm going to hunt early mid and late like into the rut and I don't move them like I'll, I'll keep them there so um friend of mine this year and I hung cameras in in June and we started in this in a in an area that had all these berries right I mean you could walk back there and get a mile from it and smell the blueberries when they got ripe like it was it's crazy and had really great velvet pictures in this area but all this stuff it, it really mattered where it led to, right? Because we were getting midday pictures in the summer, um, like, you know, 2 p.m. But then you're as the time goes on, you're seeing where all these deer are going from there. So um, the the area around the cut is the, is the area that's going to get the most light. So we're walking through these areas that um, get really thick where all the – we're just following deer trails. And as 
as I get into the timber, I'm looking for something to put put it on, like a scrape, um, but something that has a pot sweetener, right? Like I'm just not gonna just look for a scrape and why why do I want to hang it on this scrape? Like I found a line of scrapes in in this particular area. I you know did the the postseason scouting, found an area that had all these blueberries, got into the cut and found something that looked good there. Um, I ended up finding three sheds this day and they were all like 50 inches, close to 50 and 40, 45, 50 inches. So I'm like, okay, so this is an area that bucks like to hang out, found a scrape line. Okay. That looks good. And I follow it. You follow the scrape line into where it gets its, its thickest, right? I found a scrape that ended up having this, a little spring and it just has this water hole next to it. Can't see it from on X. Cause it's like, I mean, I wouldn't fit in the hole if I laid in it, but it always had what always had water in it. Um, so that was a pot sweetener for that scrape for me. Cause I know they're going to stop to drink water. They're going to stop to make a scrape and you could see the scrape was like a bowl. It wasn't like a, a little flat thing and it had, it has multiple licking branches, which is really important. I think like you can tell they're using it year after year. Um, but it was also an area where people weren't going into cause I had to get on my hands and knees to get into it. Um, and I remember thinking I found it and I'm like, Oh, I'm going to kill a deer on that scrape. And, uh, funny thing is, is the day that I was shed hunting, I'm like, I'm going to come back here. I'm going to hang all my cameras. And I ended up bumping into a guy on the road and he's like, Oh, Hey, how's it going? We ended up we ended up having been talking on Instagram for a little while. I didn't know who he was. He was just like, oh, asking me some tips or whatever. We ended up riding our bikes back to the truck together, figured out that we had been talking on Instagram for a while. <laughs> what? And, uh, and um, we were like, oh, let's hang cameras together. And we actually became really good buddies, and he actually helped me pack my deer out this fall like That's we were cool. hunting together. And uh, cool dude, man. He's in, into the filming thing, and... Um, he actually filmed a really great buck out there the year before that. Um, I don't know if I showed you pictures of it. Not that big. There's a big, I'll have to show you the pictures of it. There's a big nine pointer out there with these massive G threes. And, um, he had filmed it the year before, had it at 40 yards and couldn't get a shot at it. He's got a pretty cool YouTube video on it, but, um, we actually got that deer back on camera this past year, but that was one thing. I, I remember going back in there with him and hanging a camera on this scrape. And he's like, dude, how did you find this? I'm like, you just follow, you got to follow everything and then pick something that's got a pot. So like, I'm not going to just pick a scrape because it's a scrape in the middle of the big woods. Like they met they They could never come back to that. Right. You know, it has to do with what the scrape looks like. That thing's bowled out has to do with what's next to the scrape. And then, you know, what kind of sign is around that? Like, are they using it to bed? Are they using it to jump? I mean, a deer can jump in this area. 10 yards and lay back down and you'd never know it was there. Right. So, um, it also had to do with the people sign that I found around it. Like I know they're traveling through there cause the people sign is here and there's nothing in the middle. So that was, that's a, a big thing when you're hanging your cameras is avoid, you just avoid, you don't have to avoid where people go cause you're going to just run into pressure wherever you go. Like flagging tape, bright eyes, whatever it is, you're going to run into people. Um, so you can't get too discouraged by that. You just have to go where the deer are using the edge of where the people go. Um, and that was one of them because I had to get on my hands and knees to go through it. Um, now as the fall gets on, it, it's not that you, you can hunt the edges where the deer are coming out of it, which was what we were kind of focusing on. But I remember hanging a camera there and I'm like, one of us is going to kill a deer here. And, um, we ended up getting this nine pointer that he had had the encounter with. We had that deer on camera on that camera. I don't know how many times, multiple times, but we also had the buck that I killed on multiple times and two of the other ones that we were hoping to get on multiple times. It'd always be like that either right before dark or, you know, right after light. We did have a few, my buck was going through there in daylight all the time, but, um, it was always stop at the water hole, take a drink, stop at the scrape, check it out. So th- that's what was, like I said, that pot sweetener for that scrape was why I hang cameras there. A lot of the other things we're hanging cameras on are travel routes because they're the easiest to hunt in big woods. 
And the thing that you want to know about the travel routes is just how frequently they're being used. You know, um, if a deer, if you're only seeing a couple does go through there every other day or three times a week, it's probably not that you, you want to get that consistent everyday travel on that, on that, especially if you're hunting the end of October. Cause that's where, if does are going there every day, that's where bucks are going to be checking, checking them out. So that, that's the important part for the travel route for us is, is, um, knowing that the deer are going through there every day. Sure. So some of those cameras, I know I said I don't move my cameras. If we don't have that, we'll move a camera. And it doesn't have to be that far. You're just moving to the next place that you, you're viewing as a travel route. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like a lot of that stuff is you take more of a long-term, long-term approach. Yeah, that. we're looking at, um, you know, every – it's not that I wouldn't use this stuff for next year, but you know, just like most is like a three year goal mm -hmm. with the, uh, with the history that you're getting from cameras. And we do, we run some cell cameras just to kind of give us an idea like, Oh, this area likes to heat up in, in October, like or mid October. I think that it's still used historically. Cause if I'm, if I'm using cell cams, it may, I think it's easier for me to remember like, Oh, last year, this thing started to heat up then just cause I got that, had that excitement of, you know, mid season, like, Oh yeah, that's, that's when that heated up and knowing the next year when that camera heats up, Oh, it's time to it's go. Time to go right. Cause you could get a random picture of a buck and be like, Oh, nice random picture of a buck. But if it happens on that date last year and then it happens two days in a row the next year, you're like, Oh, I gotta go. Yeah. Because you know they're using it, yeah. And I, I think that's one of the most powerful ways you can you you can use cell cameras. Yeah. With this, like in conjunction with previous previous information or previous agreed. Data. And I, I like you know the the lifetime thing for cell cams. Like everybody gets so upset about like oh well, you could have that thing set to instant and then go in there and kill that deer. It's not like that. Yeah. It's not that easy. Right. Like you're not. First of all, you got to get in there without scaring the deer if he's in there. And it just like as in the big woods, it just doesn't work that way. Right. Like you don't just. But yeah, I mean, they have so much room. That's I was just gonna say they have so many hidey holes in different places that yeah. you go. It's not, you know, there's so much less structure there. They're not confined to. And they know, could be pockets or, fifty yards away from that area. You you could go hunt there. They could be fifty yards away. You'd never know they were yeah. there. You yeah. know. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that's my. A little bit of my camera camera work there. Well, cool. I think uh, a lot of similarities and you know what you're doing, what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we've hunted some of the same stuff, but we talked about that. Yeah. We talked about that a, a little bit yesterday. Would you say that now you've done both, right? So you've done the the private ag stuff. Yeah. And you've done the public land, big wood stuff. They're polar opposites. Yeah, they in, are in a, in a lot of cases. Yeah. Which do you prefer? I I like the I like the big wood setting. Really? I like the mountains. I like I yeah. like the long hike. I like the the hard pack outs. I like all that. Yeah. And I I don't know if it's because I'm fresh and I'm new at it, but I also hunting means a lot more to me than just hunting, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not just about seeing a deer. It's not just I mean everybody likes to shoot a deer and see a deer, but it like like genuinely it is not about that for me. It's um. It's just more about the the experience and and you know doing things with your friends and you know as far as success, it's not just about shooting a big buck. I love cooking. Like I I told you that yesterday. My wife and my kid love when I cook them venison, and that's that's a huge part for me. Like if I get to an end of season, I'm like I don't care what I shoot at this point. Like there's <laughs> you know I I'll, I'll shoot I'll shoot something small if I if I don't have anything and I and nothing's working out for me but um i mean it, it really is that aspect of it the f and the farm is good for that right like i can go there and fill Absolutely. a whole lot of doe tags um but i miss that like adventure part of it uh -huh. um but and they are they're polar opposites the way they work like actually for me i think in in the mountains and in hill type country it's easier to predict wind and thermals you're on a farm you have all different things that that work differently right like if a field gets sunny and it's 6 a.m your thermals are all blowing out there yeah. 
no matter what. Like you, and it's like, oh well, I expected it to go down the hill, not out into the field. Well, the field was the first thing that warmed up. Right. So it just there's just so many so many different ways that wind and thermals work in ag country and um, like how you know it's more rolling. Deer use it differently. You know, as, the, I hunt on a private farm. I feel like sometimes the deer are even spookier there, um, and it's not. I it's it's hard because like we have a really great setup there for archery because they, you know, there's not a lot of people hunting it during archery. Um, but when the rifle season rolls in, the, the person that owns one of the farms that they lease, uh, you know, he's got caretakers and they come in there and there's 1,800 of them and riding their four wheels around. But that carries over to the next year, right? Like those deer know like, oh, there's people in here hunting. So I, it's really not a huge difference in the pressure when you're looking at, I'm three miles back in the public and I'm on a private farm. Like the deer act the same way almost, you know, mm -hmm. as far as, as far as that goes. But yeah, I, I do. I prefer the mountains and the big woods thing. And maybe Great. it's cause I just didn't do it my whole life. But. <clears throat> yeah. Something new, something fresh. Yeah. Yep. Keeps you learning. keeps you on your toes. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Well, we, <laughs> we, I think we think there's more hours in a day when we schedule these days because we have uh, uh, another podcast. We're going to kick off with the tethered guys. Yeah. But really, it was great to meet you here in person. Glad yeah, to have for you sure. writing for the website. And Glad to be here. Enjoyed yeah. the conversation. So if yeah. uh, you want people to track you down and stalk you, where, where can they do that? Yeah, um, I'm on Instagram and Facebook. It's my uh, Instagram handle is just Aaron underscore Hepler. Um, and you can find me, it's Aaron Hepler on Facebook too. So, so we're recording this now, February 6th. I'm not sure when this will air, but I'm going to say in about two and a half, three weeks from now, you'll probably have a second article published on, yeah. on the website around, uh, I think that, that one's around shed hunting. Yep. I Perfect think. timing. Yeah. Yep. So, and then I think I have another one coming up for postseason scout, another postseason scouting okay. piece yeah, too. Yep. Yeah. Cool. We'll certainly appreciate it. Hope, look forward to talking again soon. Yeah, absolutely.